Starting in 1492, the history of America changed forever. The white man became the owner of all the land and of all the human beings who lived there. Ancient customs were prohibited, and the tribal spirits were driven out. Several ethnic groups in Paraguay lived deep in the forest, hidden away until the 20th century, when these jungles were converted into farmland and El Chaco, that legendary green hell, began its transformation into a network of stockyards. The progress of the recently arrived white man meant the end of a way of life for scores of ethnic groups. They ceased to be the masters of the jungle, becoming mere day laborers. Condemned to a life in squalid camps, the elders died of sadness at memories of better times. The children were sent to schools where they studied the geography and history of a world that was not theirs. Several ethnic groups were removed from their land and taken to the big city. Others remained hidden until the 1970s, watching the jungle disappear around them. In this century, the native people of Paraguay have had to overcome two challenges, adapting to a modern world while holding on to their cultures, languages, and religions in order to keep them from disappearing. Located in the heart of South America, Paraguay is a very sparsely populated country. A full 90% of the population has descended from one indigenous group or another. of Paraguay were virgin territory. Several tribes still lived there who had never had any kind of contact with the white man. Piranhas, jaguars, and crocodiles were the main dangers lying in wait in the forest. But the biggest threat came from the outside world. Day by day, huge swaths of virgin forest were being cleared for farmland. Life in the forest was a daily battle against cold, humidity, mosquitoes, and sickness. The native tribes were nomadic. They ate wild nuts and berries and meat from the animals they hunted all of which was abundant at the time. And they made sure to stay away from the areas that had been colonized by the white man. One such group was the Nyakundaya Che, a traditional tribe that lived in the Alto Paraná region. They moved about in silence with the stealth of a jaguar, searching among the shadows for prey and praying to the spirits for protection from predators. The animals became scarcer and scarcer. 
the ancient methods no longer attracted monkeys. Hunting parties walked for days without seeing a single animal and returned to camp empty-handed. And then came the hunger. The elders understood that there was only one way out. They would have to make contact with the white man and leave the forest. The Iguazu waterfalls were declared a World Heritage Site in the 1980s. The largest falls in the world, they are located about 25 kilometers from the point where Brazil Argentina and Paraguay meet. The falls are one of the area's biggest tourist attractions. Commercial ventures in the region have positively affected local environmental conservation, resulting in two nature reserves, one in Brazil and one in Argentina. The White World received news of the falls in 1542, when Spanish conquistadors, always in search of riches, came upon this magnificent treasure. Starting then, the fate of local tribes would be linked to the Spanish Kingdom of Castile. For quite some time, it was also linked to the Jesuits, who founded many missions known as reductions. For the Spanish Jesuit Antonio Ruiz de Montoya, these reductions were Indian villages where priests diligently brought the natives under control. Up to that point, the natives had been scattered over a vast territory. Now they were brought to cities which were safe and well organized. In 67, the Jesuits were driven out of the Spanish Empire, and the reductions were abandoned. Traditional tribal lands would never return to their rightful owners. In the name of some right, be it natural or divine, imposed on the other side of the world, Spain and Portugal became the new owners of the South American jungles and rivers, and all the human beings who lived there. The 30 reductions were built according to an extremely strict style. In the words of Diego Alvear, travelers might well have thought that the same charmed village moved along with them wherever they went. The church was the most important building. It was located in the most prominent position on the reduction central square. The priests' houses were located opposite the church, along with workshops, a school, and a library. The Indians' houses were built on one side of the church, workshops and storage sheds on the other. Today, a city stands on the ancient ruins of the reduction of Santa Maria. Three centuries ago, these were the tiny homes of the natives. In the old central square, a tower remains. It once formed part of the ancient Jesuit church. A 
small museum is located inside, where several period sculptures can be found. With the end of the military and political conquest came the beginning of a religious one. Traditional gods were banished from the natives' altars to be replaced by other deities who did not answer the worried prayers of these inhabitants of the New World. The white man would never understand the impossibility of making someone accept something he does not believe. The natives learned to disguise their beliefs with Christian statuary creating a fusion of religions in which Christian saints existed alongside tribal spirits. The Shear community in the town of Puerto Catorce de Mayo is located just south of the Bahia Negra military base. The enclave is far out in the middle of the El Chaco jungle, known as the Mato Grosso on the other side of the Paraguay River. This isolation has made it possible for indigenous peoples to maintain their own way of life, free of political and religious pressures. The women spend their days watching over their children and weaving wicker baskets. The men are in charge of caring for herds of sheep, of hunting, and most importantly, of fishing. Fish are quite abundant in these waters. There is just one danger, crocodile. Superstitions help keep them far away. Of course, the doubtful effect of carving crocodile-shaped figures out of wood is strengthened by the common sense of not getting too close to the shore at those times of day when the huge reptiles are hunting capybara among the weeds. elders around the world, these men try to convince their young people that the sports they played long ago are the best. For these boys, who follow their favorite Brazilian soccer players on TV, the game of porro, which is similar to hockey, isn't very interesting. But the adults make every effort to keep this sport from disappearing. Sundown on an early spring day, something truly unusual happens in the village. This is the cohesive element of the Ashir spirit, its identifying trait. Women begin to invoke the spirits by shaking these grain-filled gourds. Within minutes, an answer comes from the depths of the forest. We are inside the Tobit, a ceremonial space where the spirits of nature, known as Anabsoro, come together. They are about to come out of hiding for the Delhi Bili, the most important date on the Ashir's mystical calendar. When the invocation ends, the spirits exit their kingdom and enter the Arra, the sacred area where dances and rites are interpreted. The Delhi Bili lasts several days, during which hundreds of spirits, representing all sorts of concepts and elements that affect the community, will come out to dance.
Throughout the night, the rhythm of the maracas and the light of the moon create a magical atmosphere. The spirits burst into the area lit by bonfires, only to disappear again into the night like ghosts. The spirits come one after another, representing health, the hunt, predictions for a fruitful harvest, and whimsical matchmakers. The tribe shaman leaves the tobits to bless the children. He wants to familiarize the youngest members of the tribe with the imposing presence of the strange masked beings who govern the community's spiritual life. These activities, so far removed from the prevailing Christianity of Paraguay, brought on a series of disputes with the authorities. But thanks to God, or the Anabsoros, the arguments are a thing of the past. <coughs> At the end of the celebration, the Anabsoros set their somber energy aside and play with the village women. A bachelor spirit is looking for a wife. He courts the women by tempting them, scaring them, and teasing them. But the Ishina women are not fooled, and they answer back. The spirit fights with a woman, but she is stronger and wins as usual, forcing the clownish and cowardly spirit to slink away. Afterward, a pitched battle begins in which the men challenge their wives. This unusual version of the age-old battle of the sexes always ends in laughter, ending the solemn tone of the Deli Billy ceremonies. and livestock. But there was a time when El Chaco was an impenetrable forest, which was the setting for a war and whose colonization saw the loss of many lives. El Chaco covers 700,000 square kilometers which were once inhabited by numerous indigenous groups. Groups like the Ayoreo, Lengua, and Nivacle slowly came into contact with the white man. And systematically, they were stripped of their land, their culture, and their beliefs. In 1932, Paraguay and Bolivia went to war to gain control of the region, and the future of these tribes became even more uncertain. One of the war's most important battles was fought here in Fort Boqueron. Today, the victims of the skirmish are remembered with monuments and commemorative plaques. Paraguay and Bolivia 
are the only two landlocked countries in South America, making control of the Paraguay River extremely important, strategically speaking. But the result of the war was catastrophic. It meant economic ruin for both countries and the death of nearly 100,000 doctrine laid out by religious reformer Menno Simons. Since founding their religion in the 17th century, the Mennonites have been thrown out of numerous countries. The tight-knit society has held on to the language and customs of nearly four centuries ago. The government of Paraguay gave up the inhospitable territory of El Chaco. By working extremely hard, the Mennonites managed to transform the area, adapting it to their needs. They cut down huge sections of the forest to make way for crops. They built barns, schools, and churches. And starting in 1930, they began to establish cooperatives that grew until they were the most important milk producers in Paraguay. The city of Philadelphia was founded in 1930 in the middle of nowhere. Today, it is a Paraguayan city that belongs to a group of white men and women with blonde hair and blue eyes who speak a German dialect. But there is a dark side to this story. The indigenous population is not permitted to live in this white city. They come here only to work in the lowest level jobs in the Mennonite industries, like this milk factory, which is the jewel in the city's economic crown. Members of the Ayoreo, Lengua, and Ivaclay tribes receive just enough education so that they can be of use in production jobs. But every local industry is directed and controlled by white men. The possibility of including the natives in the Mennonites' economic prosperity is, for the moment, unthinkable. The salary for a native worker in this sawmill or in the brick factory is $3 a day. And in most cases, this is the only income a family has. No matter how hard these young employees work, they will never escape this desperate situation. Even so, the natives work hard in these unsafe and unhealthy factories. And when their workday is over, they travel 60 kilometers to their homes, having survived one more day of misery. It is no surprise that more and more people long for the days when they lived in the forest when El Chaco required a day-to-day -day fight for survival. At least then, the natives were the masters of their own destiny. <laughs> At Campo Loro, a settlement inhabited by the Ayoreo tribe, Children go to school to learn to read and write in Spanish. The building is modest, but completely new. Sadly, this is the only brick building in the entire town. The rest are wooden huts with tin roofs. In the summer months, they are so swelteringly hot that it is impossible to be inside. There is one small store where the most famous drink in the world is sold. Warm, of course. There is no electricity here. The elders, 
who were once in charge of educating the youngest members of the tribe, now have nothing to say about the future. The society into which they are being integrated with great difficulty is a mystery to them. Ancient legends speak of the hunt and wars with other tribes. But now they are nothing more than old stories. These children will grow up in a world that is totally different from the one their ancestors knew. And they will have no references based on experience. This good man may be capable of moving through the jungle and killing a cougar but those skills mean nothing in this new world. As night falls on the outskirts of the village, a shaman invokes the spirits. <laughs> the ancient beliefs are still alive, but tribal healers know they must teach the next generation all the wisdom surrounding the magical rituals that guided the tribe for so many years. This ceremony is being held in honor of the ancestors of a dying culture. The elders insist that there is still a group of Ayoreo living in the jungle who have never seen a white man. If this is the case, they are the only hope for the survival of this millennial culture. Another manner of adapting to modern day life can be found in Asuncion, the capital of Paraguay, where members of the Maca tribe live. Craft vendors spread out their wares in the most crowded plazas, where from time to time, some tourist or other takes an interest in their baskets or necklaces. The Maka were probably the only people to benefit from the El Chaco War. They were used as guides by the army, and when the war ended, they were given a reservation in Asuncion by General Belayev. Installed in modest barracks, the Maka learned the language, laws, and customs of the white man, while enjoying the benefits of running water electricity, and modern medicine. The descendants of those guides grew up in the shanty towns, affected by unemployment and poverty. But instead of turning their backs on their roots, they discovered how to exploit their cultural differences. Today, 
Many of Asuncion's maca make their living selling crafts. They also allow tourists to take their pictures or they dance for them. Life for the Maka tribe is far from ideal. And the reservation lacks many things. But at least they have gotten local politicians to make them the same promises they make to white citizens. The population has grown. Life expectancy rates have risen quickly. And the tribal youth have the same problems and worries as other young people in Paraguay. Today's elders are the children of those who participated in the war. Even though they have never lived like their parents did, they have held on to many of their traditions, like gathering for a game of Witsukal, a game of strategy and skill. The marks on the floor indicate a battlefield. The wooden rods represent warriors who advance or retreat according to the outcome of a throw of these sticks which are used like dice. The women of the tribe spend most of the year making handicrafts. They make handbags, ponchos, and hammocks using cotton cloth in white, red, and blue. These are both the colors of the tribe and the Paraguayan national flag. When tourist season rolls around, they travel to Ciudad del Este, near the Iguazu waterfalls, to sell their wares. spot a tourist ready to spend some money, the maca put on their traditional clothes, deck themselves out with makeup and feathers, and do a few dances. mimic the screeching of birds, the rolling of thunder, and the whispering of the jungle. But today, all of that significance has been lost. city, and the Ayoreo and Nibacle were surviving in the shadow of Mennonite prosperity. The jungles of Nyakundai were being cleared to make room for soybean fields. Huge landowners bought up thousands of hectares of unproductive forest and transformed them into sweeping extensions of farmland. Those natives who still lived in the jungle started to be considered a bothersome inconvenience.
until well into the 1970s, the natives of Alto Paraná were hunted like animals, or else they were taken captive and sold as slaves. Besieged, persecuted, and with no food from the forest, the Nyakundai Ache left the jungle. For the first time, they witnessed horizons with no trees. But this was not a vision of good things to come. A European missionary named Bjarni Fostervold found the tribe and secured them a place to live. A modest reservation between modern tools they never could have dreamed of when living in the jungle. Axes and machetes with steel blades. Compared to their rudimentary tools carved out of stone, useless for cutting down trees, the sharp steel blades were an absolute blessing. Before, it had taken hours of work to extract tender palm hearts, but now it took only minutes. And the same was the case when collecting firewood or undertaking such tasks as blazing trails through the forest. But not everything was better in the new world. The white man's medicine, aside from being scarce and expensive, was not well tolerated by the Ache. The food supply in the jungle is not well balanced, and most indigenous people suffer from malnutrition and vitamin deficiency. Medicines that were used commonly among the white man were far too aggressive for the natives. As a result, they continued to put their faith in natural remedies from the forest. The Ache hold an incredible amount of information about nature. Their scientific knowledge has been growing for generations. With a variety of plants, leaves, and flowers, they are able to mix up scores of remedies for different sicknesses. These creepers are a good example. They are ground up and then used for a muscle tonic with antiseptic properties.
The diet of the tribal youth is completely different from that of the Ache who lived in the jungle. Some of the settlement's men and women survived more than half their lives on a poor and scant diet. When walking through the forest, they didn't even have baskets to hold the wild fruit they found. They were unable to gather any more than they could hold in their hands. In spite of obvious improvements, however, discouragement became rampant just a few years after leaving the jungle. The break with life in the forest had been far too traumatic. New illnesses appeared, which neither natural remedies nor modern medicines were able to control. Not even massages with medicinal plants were enough to combat the fever and insomnia. Once the novelty of civilization had passed, the new way of life lost interest. Pessimism cast a dark shadow over the community's future. There was a meeting of the tribal chiefs. They sang their ancient songs and called on the spirits. And they found that the Ache, those invisible hunters, yearned for their jungle home. The heart of each native beats with a need to walk through the forest, to hunt monkeys, to go up against the jaguar, to feel free. it happened. Thanks to the efforts of the missionary Bjarni Fosterwald and the support of other indigenous groups, the Paraguayan authorities gave in and the Ache got their forest back. They continued to work in the fields, but in their free time, they painted themselves with ashes and clay to make themselves invisible in the undergrowth. They lost themselves in the forest and played at being a small tribe that had never come into contact with the white man. They went back to tracking anteaters, hunting capybara, and shooting at the ever-elusive treetop monkeys. fighting enemy tribes and other clans. They remembered the times when warriors from other tribes had snuck up to their camp to steal their women. They recalled arguments between families when the women intervened, insisting on peace. Oh, <laughs> 
mới Chị mà cực ca chơi mấy Vì bà tu đi mù chơ đà At night, they gather around the fire, and Guategui, the eldest of the Nyakundai Ache, tells his children once again about the day when the white man came. He tells of how it was raining, and how they knew that Bjarne Fostervold and his father had been on their trail for more than two years. <laughs> Then he speaks in hushed tones of the night when they saw the two missionaries and considered killing them, but how in the end they decided to leave the forest. <laughs>